Hi, I'm Jason Gorber for ThatShelf.com, and we're here to crack this guy open and look at some Joni Mitchell on vinyl. Big change. Another Joni Mitchell video here on this channel. We're going to celebrate Joni as much as we can. Her archive series continues apace. This is the latest, um, a second box set from an asylum period. We're going to crack it open and see what's inside. Um, this literally just showed up. Uh, I'm very excited to see. I mean, it's come a little bit ridiculous. I have these records already. I have first pressings of most of them. Um, also, Mobile Fidelity is doing a number of these uh, uh, that they will be doing sort of fancier versions. It's Joni. What are you going to do? This is the way we're actually going to run things. Inside the outer shipping box, we have, as we crack all this open, we have this guy. So this is what we're actually going to be looking at today. So this is Joni Mitchell, The Asylum Albums, 1976 to 1980. Our previous look was at both the Quadraphonic and the um, uh, actual box set from the previous, the 1972 to 75. So this set includes, obviously, the next records. And these are some of the more extraordinary records in her discography. It's when she completely leaned into playing with some monster players, monster jazz players. Um, sort of, you can situate it as her Jocko period in, in a funny way, the stuff that she actually ended up doing with the likes of Matheny and Don Elias and Michael Brecker, but also um, the inimitable Jocko Pastorius. Incredible, incredible bass player. Uh, him, He had a, a tragic life. Uh, but such an extraordinary, explosive talent completely changed the way that the instruments actually dealt with. And, and you know, um, she, if, if you look at the people that she has played with over her career, um, I, again, I keep saying this, um, uh, but it's, it bears repeating. There's a couple musicians in the history of popular music that have embiggened themselves, have enlightened, have, have, have brought forth other talents, particularly other talents from other sort of idioms, and brought them to the fore. These are artists that surround themselves with the best of the best. And if all you do is sort of do a discographical um, breakdown of the people in Joni's band, like you take who has played with Joni Mitchell, and then you sort of break out who was doing it, there's a couple of these artists where you get some unbelievable stuff. Frank Zappa comes to mind, Miles Davis, Sting, Paul Simon. These are instrumentalists that themselves just created an absolute army of other musicians. The James Browns of this world, um, uh, Sly and the Family Stone, um, the stuff that Sly Stone worked with, not quite the same, but you, you get where I'm going with. These, these, these individual artists, these individual people that themselves are the the linchpins for the careers of so many other people that realized when they got to a certain point of success that they could surround themselves with extraordinarily competent players and and elevate their own music. And where Whereas Joni, who's one of the great guitarists um, and great piano players of all time, maybe not on a technical level, surrounded herself with people who had the most extraordinary technical um, abilities, the Herbie Hancocks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in this period... We have here um, some very famous records. We have Hajira um, with uh, Coyote and Amelia, two of the songs that um, um, for many people sort of help define uh, who she is. Don Juan's Reckless Daughter will get into the sort of um, controversy about that in the new um, record cover. We have Mingus. Now, the, the Mingus record is one of the primary ways that I was into sort of a rediscovery of Johnny. I just thought of her as this sort of, you know, we had to like her because she was Canadian. She's a bunch of folk stuff. And I really wasn't into it. And it wasn't until I was in my late 20s, early 30s, that, and through Mingus, um, it was Mingus and Blue. And Blue had been presented to me as this sort of, you know, conventional singer-songwriter, all the stuff that she um, obviously fights against. But I had never heard anything like Mingus. I'd never known that that was an aspect of her character and her musicality. And it's so, so extraordinary. And... If you combine all of these, you get, in, from what I firmly believe is one of the great live records of all time, uh, Shadows and Light, an unbelievable performance, uh, just rock solid. 
um, really, really fun um, um, video of it. It's shot on video, so it doesn't look great, but the performance of the playing is unbelievably great. So yeah, let's crack this open and see uh, what the records themselves look at. These are supposedly, uh, I will double check on the front, um, continuing the line of uh, these are Bernie Grumman masters um, done uh, with the, you know, full archival permission of uh, Ms. Mitchell. And we will see how these actually play out. So right from the outset we have here our little blurb, which itself is a trifold gateful. And so we have an essay and we have some of these uh, sort of watercolor paintings, no doubt done by Joni herself. And this is Meryl Streep actually writing the intro or the inner on this one. So we're going to wait and uh, actually read that off uh, um, uh, uh, when we actually dive in the records. But I love that Meryl Streep's involved now because of course she is. Um, here we have Hajira. Um, no um, funniness on the cover, but... Um, the photo reproduce really beautifully well. The gatefold with the lyrics. The record itself in a paper sleeve. So not polylined, but put it in the paper sleeve. This will obviously come out um, and be re-sleeved. We then have Don Juan's Reckless Daughter. The new version of the um, cover. The original version is three characters. One of them is Joni Mitchell in blackface, a character that she used to play. Life has changed. No longer done, ironically or not, ironically, so they have changed it. Now, we can we can uh, have um, whatever representation we want here. We can talk about the iconography. We can talk about the adoption of other cultures and stuff like that. I mean, hell, she's wearing a beret here. I'm not sure what we have in terms of... Uh, um, authenticity there, but nonetheless, this is the new cover. This is a replacement cover uh, that follows along similar layout. The inside looks to be about the same. The records themselves, again, paper sleeves, double record set with the vinyl inside. Same, same, same. So the albums themselves on black vinyl, pressed, and let's just see if I can actually read this nicely. Yeah, not well enough to actually see. I'm usually really bad at this. Oh, look, a BG. I found a BG. Bernie Grumman. There we go. It's always sort of tucked in. You got the uh, the matrices on one side and the BGs out by themselves. So there we are. Um, that's the uh, the inside of Don Juan um, record uh, two, side three and four. Then we have, as we said, Mingus. Absolutely stunning in memory of Charles Mingus on the back. Really beautiful layout. The, the, the printing is immaculate. And this is one of those, what? another Johnny painting. This is one of those where the album itself is sort of tucked in, in between this. So I actually can slide it out either way. And it's on a paper sleeve, poly lined. Much prefer this record immediately looks a lot better than those that are actually in the paper lined sleeve. Again, they're all gonna be clean. They're all gonna be re-sleeved anyway. And then finally, this one's actually a little bit more um, Interesting how they've done it. Shadows and light. So it's it'll be hard to see. I'll try to get it on this angle here. You can see that the actual sort of TV screen is slightly embossed, as is the writing here. So there's a little bit of dimensionality on this on the uh, covers themselves. The same thing on the back. The actual sort of four by three rounded corner. Um, uh, I almost said Trinitron, but CRT tube. Uh, kind of aesthetic that gives the sort of video look, and that actually gives a good example of what the actual image itself looks like, the sort of video-y, sort of blown out version. Uh, same thing on the front. Um, it, for audio alone, it would be nice to have a, a, a new uh, version sort of presented so that people have access to it. And then the inside, we have uh, shots from the taped concert. The record itself, 
are in paper lined sleeves with more illustration. And the same thing here on the inside, the record itself looking pretty spotless. So this is our initial look at the latest Asylum box set from Ms. Mitchell. After this, um, this really is the prime sort of Johnny Mitchell for me, up to the end of this, up to Shadows and Light. After this, she does do some interesting stuff. She goes in some pretty f fascinating directions. For me, it's a slightly less prime, obviously, by the time she gets out of the decade. Um, and in the 80s, she goes in directions that I don't necessarily follow her um, as closely as I do with this. But between these uh, these two Asylum box sets, you have the sort of span. I mean, Court and Spark really starts it for me, and, and Shadows and Light sort of caps it. But that period is like it is with Elton John, Paul Simon, <laughs> um, The Who, uh, any of these uh, bands where you have the Beatles, for that matter. Um, if you're going from Rubber Soul to... Um, Abbey Road, if you're going from Court and Spark to Shadows and Light, you're just looking at this span where there's stuff before in the Beatles kids, there's stuff after, but you know where I'm going. Um, it's just, this is the core for me, for my love of Joni, it, are these records. And uh, Don Juan's Reckless Daughter is actually the album on this, I know the least. Hajira, the, the second least. I have played the shit out of Mangus. Um, and Court and uh, Court and Spark, Shadows and Light is um, has been played to death, and and yet I cannot wait. Every time I put it on, I'm hearing new things, new elements, new exquisite turns of phrase, and it is through Shadows and Light that I know the songs from Don Juan and Hajira in a better way. It's like the, the original Coyote and Shadows and Light I know better than I know the album version. And so this box set gives me an opportunity to sort of dive more deeply into the originals and to hear it um, uh, in the way that, at least in this context, are intended. I've had such great pleasure, audio-wise, with the other um, uh, elements uh, within the, uh, the uh, Joni Mitchell archive, the JMA, as it were. Um, and uh, there's a logo JMA at the bottom there. Um, <laughs> And I'm super excited to be diving into this. Now, I will say, I'll put this out there. My understanding is that there are quadraphonic uh, mixes of these as well. And so if there is a follow-up quadio box to sort of get the uh, last bits of the, the surround mixes that um, are, are vintage um, from Joni, I would be absolutely ecstatic. But for now, I'm really, really happy that I have this box and I'm happy to yet again take an opportunity to celebrate the goddess, the queen, the immaculate Johnny Mitchell. For ThatShelf.com, I'm Jason Gorber. Thank you so much for watching. Subscribe, follow us on social media, let us know in the comments what you think of Ms. Mitchell and her music, and we will see you in the next video. All the best. Take care.